And, um, but to start with, and to give us some groundwork on the first point in relationship to things that qualify you to exercise the office. Not, this isn't what is required as far as duties. <clears throat> this is what qualifies you to even be able or privileged to carry out those duties. <clears throat> and um, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament with the priesthood that was there, <clears throat> there was uh, in the shadow of um, the Levitical priesthood, there's only one way that you could be a priest, and that was that you had to be born into the right family. And in that, this case, it was the tribe of Levi. You had to be born into that family. <clears throat> and um, here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 says, For as in Adam all die, even so in, or you can say in union, for as in union with Adam all die. Even so, in union with Christ, shall all be made alive. <clears throat> all right, so the point of the qualification was in the Old Testament, which was only a shadow, <clears throat> you had to be of the tribe of Levi. You had to be of a particular family. You had to be of a particular generation. And if you weren't of that generation, <clears throat> no matter how good you were, no matter how empathetic you were to be a priest to minister to people or how good a because one of the duties of the priest is to preach or to share and to teach no matter how good of a teacher you were no matter how um, enabled you were if you were not of the tribe of Levi <coughs> then you were rejected and um, this says those all in Adam die they're rejected. Only those in union with Christ shall be made alive. So in the New Testament, at the cross, at the cross, you must be separated from the rejected tribes. You must be separated from Adam and all that is rejected and said, no, you cannot come before me. No, you cannot serve me. No, you cannot live for me. No, you cannot carry on the duties <coughs> that I would want you to carry on simply because you are of the wrong tribe. You are of the rejected tribe. And in the New Testament, we have to be separated, and that's the purpose. I mean, that is the purpose of the cross, is to separate us from that generation, that people, that um, tribe <clears throat> that has been rejected and to be joined to the one that comes forth in resurrection and simply put for us, <clears throat> it is to be joined to the acceptable one. It is to find acceptance not in ourselves, but in the fact that that we were born into something, or you can say born again into something. Now this is incredibly significant because it's not just, <clears throat> well, I got born again. That's my free ticket. No. You've been added to the tribe, as it were, that is acceptable. You've been added to the one who God will accept, and only in union. <clears throat> Only in Christ, only in oneness with him, and, and only as you are understood. I mean, you, not, you know, God understands the cross, do we? Only as you understand that will you approach God on the right basis. Because if you don't understand it, then you're going to think it's still the old covenant. And you're going to always be working on numero uno. Number one, you're always going to be trying to improve number one. Well, I got news for you. You're not number one. Jesus is number one, and in the eyes of the Lord, you're number two. 
you figure it out. I'm just, it just, you know. <clears throat> Paul said, I count everything but dung for Christ. You know, that means he's number one and everything else is number two. So, <clears throat> it's there in the word. You, you wrestle with it. <clears throat> so there is this reality that everything that is not of, you got to understand that, it, of is not something about uh, joining a Christian religion. <clears throat> of pertains to, to coming out from because we are in. Of is to be different than what we were because what we were in Adam was, it was us, yeah, it was our personality, it was our body, but it was motivations that were selfish. It was using people. It was taking advantage of situations. <clears throat> it was either manipulating or using power to get your way. It was not able to suffer or to do without just to be happy to be with the one that you love. See, and that, what is, you know, well, you know, if, if it's love, there is no suffering, right? If it's love, there is no hardship. If, there, if it's love, well, I got news for you. You'll find more pain in love. And I don't mean, I, I don't mean, you know, abusive relationships. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about, <clears throat> I'm talking about that if you love someone and they misunderstand you, and you, that hurts really deep because you know what you feel. And you think they know what, they, what you feel. And then they start doubting and, start, and you go, excuse me? What planet are you from? <laughs> Where are you coming from on these issues? Well, I'm coming from my head, my own personal, you know, toilet. <coughs> Well, flush it. <laughs> flush it. And, and put on the mind of Christ. And put on the mind of Christ. And so, um, this, this, un this, th this whole thing, I mean, <clears throat> see, we draw it up on a chart, and if, as long as we understand the chart, we say we understand it. My God, what a deception that is. What a deception to... to conclude that because we can understand it and find some scriptures to back it up and <clears throat> now have new insight into certain scriptures that we understand it. The understanding of this does not come through theology or academia. It comes through intimate, relating, failing, coming back, finding his heart, hearing, <clears throat> you know what I mean, and believing and running to instead of from. <clears throat> Anybody know what I'm talking about? It comes from really and truly <clears throat> because our mind, you know, we think that if we have it in our mind that we've really got it. We're so wrong. We're so wrong. Because our makeup of who we are and what our past is and everything. It shouldn't have any sway in us, but it has everything because we can know certain things and if we feel like that's not lining up or whatever, whether it is or isn't, we can, we, you know, we just totally leave what we believe and we go, well, you know, but, you know, I mean, you know, I, I you know, here's the academic part. Oh, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm raised with him in oneness. We're one. This is eternal. And then you get into some situation like Paul described, nakedness or peril, where he's, he's not clothing you, he's not, he's not helping you, he's not there at the moment you wanted him to be there. We question his heart. Yeah, see, we don't, we don't, we, we don't question Almighty God. We, you, know, you might think that's what you're doing, but to him you're questioning his heart. He questioned his heart. And then... That's where you get into the master, carest thou not that we perish. You know, the guys in the boat when the storm came up and Jesus is asleep down there. And, Wake up, don't you care? Don't you, you know, folks, 
He's not the one that needs to wake up. We are the ones that need to wake up. And not wake up to theology, but to Jesus, to that one that's at rest. Why are you at rest in this crisis, Lord? How is this, you know, but see, the only way we can read that is <clears throat> he doesn't care about me. You see, I mean, the real issue is us. He doesn't care about me. We, you know, we don't even venture off on little trails of we're not really in any danger at all, boys. We're not, you know, if he's, if he's not worried, I'm not worried. Now, that's union. That's oneness. If he's not worried, I'm not worried. The day I start seeing him worry, I'll worry. <laughs> you know, you, you come into the throne room and he's going, man, I just don't know how we're going to handle all this. I just don't know what we're going to do. I just, you know, things are starting to get out of hand down there. I don't know. Well, I got news for you. Things are already out of hand down here, but they're not out of hand in him. Where are you? Whose are you? Not what do you believe theologically as a Christian. I'm serious. Not what you believe theologically as a Christian. It was never meant to be a theological religion. It is what do you believe of him? What do you believe of his word? Out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaketh. What do you believe concerning his word? No, his heart. What do you believe? <clears throat> well, that's why theology believing fails in the crisis. Fails in the crisis. Um, the old thought, well, I'm not worthy to be a priest. I'm not good enough. I'm, I, I will fail. I will mess everything up. Don't do it, Lord. Don't put me in the priesthood. Well, you already knew that. He knew you would fail. If, if the you you're talking about is square, then he already knows in Adam, in union with Adam, you being you, there's no hope. There's no hope. He already knows that. Thanks for warning him. Lord, I'm telling you, you're making a big mistake. Yes, you are absolutely right if you think he still sees you here in Adam. It is a, in a horrendous mistake. <clears throat> and all the mistakes that you have made, well, I won't say all of them, but I'll say many of the mistakes. Well, I can't say that because, because there, are diff there is sin and then there's trespasses. You know, a sin is something that's, broken the law, trespass is something that's hurt somebody else that may not in itself be sin. So I'll just, I'll say, most of what we do wrong, most of the, the failures we've had were when our union was coming out from the old without full recognition of being married to Jesus, being one. Knowing, you know, because, you know, if you're one and you still mess up, oneness overrides sin. So where's that in the Bible? Love covers a multitude of sins. Am I right or wrong? And you will fail. And you will mess up. But the, but the basis in his heart has nothing to do with you failing or messing up. The basis of his heart is, will you be with him? Will you believe him? Will this become how you see yourself? And not this chart, of course. <laughs> this chart cannot be how you see yourself. I was blessed very early in my Bible school days, this chart was drawn with the square on one side and the cross and then the circle on the other side in Adam put in the square and in Christ put on the other. And I was blessed pretty early on that God showed me the concept behind it. He didn't show me the chart and go, okay, you, you, can you kind of understand that? Everybody was here, then they went to the cross and died, 
And now they're here in Christ. He didn't show me that. He showed me the concepts of his heart and the purposes behind it. And the purpose behind it was not just to save sinners. He could have done that without making us one. Can I get an amen? He could have saved you without making you one. Now, we get challenged bunches of times a day on this, don't we? The challenge is, are you of the right tribe? Are you, of the, are you functioning as a priest? Are you holding yourself in oneness with him? Remember, Levi means join. Are you holding yourself there? Are you, are you um, more aware of him than you are of you, than you are of your surroundings down here? When I say more aware of him, I don't mean walk around going, oh, there's a Jesus walking around on this earth going, oh, Jesus. I'm talking about more aware of the reality of what the cross and the resurrection has accomplished so that you, you are kept. Kept. Where your mind does not wander. Where your fears do not grab hold. Like, you know, the concept of, for example, in your heart, the concept of oneness is this medium-sized person. But the concept of fear is this big, big person that walks in and while you're sitting there musing with oneness, fear comes in, pushes that out of the way, pushes you away from him, and begins to press his thoughts. Now, fear is not just some emotion, folks. With it come, is based on thought. Fear thoughts. Fear thoughts. Where it says, well, this is this, and that is that, and this is this, and that's that, and and so it's like pretty soon you're surrounded not by, gi by uh, but, but by giants, all of them being different fears presenting themselves. Pretty soon, while, while you were there a moment ago enjoying the fellowship of oneness and of Christ, all of a sudden a crowd has gathered around you and you are being pushed and and taunted and, and everything else. And you know, you know how you got into that situation? You allowed it. You allowed it. Why does the Lord let this stuff happen to me? You know, and we, and we say, all things work together for good, so praise God. See, we just, we just allow all sorts of stuff. We allow it. We allow it instead of saying, you know what? <clears throat> Only one thing that matters to me. Only one thing have I desired. Only one thing. I desire one. Because if I'm not mistaken there, the word thing is not in the original Hebrew. One have I desired. <laughs> you know. And when you start desiring him, Fears come up and they go, well, what about this? What about that? And what about it? You talking to me? I'm talking to Jesus. Do not interrupt me when I'm with Jesus. I'm a priest. I am behind the veil. You do not belong here. You get out now. Huh? You know, we're wanting God to do that. God's wanting, you know, because you're his priest, which is a beloved situation, because you're his bride, which is a beloved situation, he's, you know, because the people outside in the outer court, or, you know, out there living in tents and whatever, he'll go out there and do whatever for him. He looks at you like his priest. He looks at you like his bride. And he'd like for you to be with him where he's at. You know? Come. Isn't that what 
Levi did? I mean, oh, look, um, you know the story of where that whole situation happened. When the, the, the golden calf and then Moses came down and he said, who is on the Lord's side, right? You remember that story? And then Levi picked up the sword. They, they picked up the sword and went through the camp and cut down their, their brothers. Look in um, Numbers 25. I'm going to give you another story along the same line that is the same spirit and the proliferation of the priesthood. Now, I'm, I'm doing this because you have to be of the right tribe. If, you're, if you don't start there, then it doesn't matter what you do or who you think you are. You can be shook. And if you will, you can be shaken all the way back to Adam. You can be. But there is the necessity, not just of what Levi did when Moses came down from the mount and made a stand for the Lord. You have to be a priest. Are you getting my point? They were, we, we are. They were, we're supposed to be too. In other words, this is a reality in us, not just a reality in Christ. What made them priests? What made the tribe of Levi priests? Because they stood up for the Lord. Because they stood on the Lord's side. That's precious to the Lord. Do you not see that? You know, he's always standing up for the average Christian. When they get in trouble on their job, when they need money, when they need healing, when they need, he's always standing up. He's looking for some to just stand up with him, not just for him, with him. Walk right up, step, step beside him, say, I'm with you. I'm with you. Numbers 25. Um, <clears throat> let's start in verse 5. <clears throat> this is right after the situation with Balaam. And, uh, and Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. Now, notice the similarity between that and what, what the Levites did in the very beginning. This isn't slay the enemy. This is slay your brothers and sisters, or, you know, you understand. Now, notice this. Slay every one of, of his men that were, what is the word there? Joined. Slay every one that was a Levite of this other God. <laughs> it's, in the Hebrew, it would read that way. The word would be Levi. It means joined, but it's the word Levi. So they would read it in the Hebrew, slay every man that is a Levite to Baal Peor, this false god. Well, guess what? All he's saying is embrace the cross, enact the cross, put the cross forth. When you see stuff that's not joined to Jesus but joined to something else, then take out your sword, take the word of God and cut it to pieces and get rid of it. Apply the cross, don't just believe that Jesus did something 2,000 years ago. Now, remember, we're in a different situation here. This isn't the same story. <clears throat> so, verse 6, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianish, Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. Now notice this. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron. We're, the, the, the scriptures are trying to bring out something here. They're trying to bring out lineage. They're trying to bring out that this is, this is the ongoingness of priesthood. Can you see that? This is not just random words or this is not trying to just tell you 
some bodies from which he came. It is trying to specifically show the continuation of the priesthood, meaning we're not just called priests by name. We carry it on. <coughs> well, let's read on here. And when Phineas, <coughs> the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent. Notice that he didn't go after the Midianitish woman. He's going after what? Well, he's going after somebody in adultery, right? Yes, but no. They have joined. Do you understand that? They have joined with, see, the, you know, if this man that went in the tent with this woman had a wife, that's not the issue with God right now. Here's the issue. You, the Lord says you have joined to something else. Folks, we have the potential of joining to this other God over here all the time this, and making him our head. Do you understand? And the Lord would say to you as a priest, pull out the cross and exercise the destructive power. Amen? Be a priest. Stand up for me. And you see that? It's not stand up for my religion. It's the Lord speaking. Stand up for the religion I gave you because if you will, then you'll be my priest. It's not stand, it's stand up for me. Be joined to me. You see the intimacy of this? You really can see the depth of that in the book of Hosea. My God. The agony of the Lord. And so, you know, God put Hosea through a similar situation just so somebody would kind of understand. Because nobody did. Everybody, well, that's God. He's got it made. You know, we're, you know. <laughs> no, he doesn't have it made. Look at his people. Look at his body. My God. <clears throat> All right, so he took a javelin in hand, verse 8, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her abdomen. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Let's read on. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them. That I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. This is a very interesting phrase, covenant of peace. You'll find it a lot, particularly in relationship to those who join on the Lord's side. The priesthood, things like that. <clears throat> Verse 13, And he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God. Is that good? Well, I th you know, he's a, Phineas is of what tribe? He's already of the tribe of Levi, isn't he? What, what's God doing giving him a covenant of peace? What's that about? What's God doing establishing an eternal covenant with him? Well, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's not really with Levi, but with those that are zealous after God. And I don't, I'm not talking about religious zeal. That, that want the Lord. That seek the Lord. That want to be on his side. That stand for him. That will give up, you know, whatever to be with the Lord. that will simply look at that cross 
And, and here's the way I've always viewed this, and I've shared this before previously in the consecration of the tribe of Levi and my sharing that I did on that. I look at this like this is, this is us. This is one body. And anything in us that is not lined up, that has not come under the jurisdiction of the cross, that has not come under the swing and the sway of the sword of Levi in us should be put to death. My point here is not to go around and attack your brothers and sisters. My point is, if you really want to be zealous, you see stuff. Do you, do you ever see, anybody ever see anything off in anybody? Anybody ever see anything off in anybody? If you, how do you feel towards that person? And then if you see something similar off in you, how do you feel about you? Well, you know, God's grace is sufficient, and he's going to take care of me, and he's dealing with me, and he's working on me, and he's... But for them, my God, you better shape up, man. Hell is opening up around you. The flames are licking at your feet. <laughs> it's all, you know, as long as it's not us. I mean, we know God's merciful to us. Well, I don't know about you. you you're pretty messed up. But you see, if, we're, if, we're, if, we are, if we truly stand up for what's right, why can't we stand up just as much against it in us? Maybe our eyes are too quick to look around. Maybe our eyes are too quick to notice because we're looking for it in others, and we're not looking for it in ourselves. To stand on the Lord's side is to be on his side against yourself. That's the greatest proof. Anybody can stand with him against something else. It's the day you have to stand with him against your own mind, against your own feelings against your own uh, demand for justice. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Hallelujah. So I just thought this was a pretty amazing scripture here when he said, and he shall, and he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God. Same thing Levi did. And he didn't say, you will, I, I, you, you're of the, he didn't say to this to Phineas, your grandfather is Aaron, the first high priest. Your father is Eliezer, the second high priest. And I will make you a priest forever. He already had that. But this man stood in covenant with God in it. Not just, well, I was born into it, so it's mine. I was born again, so it's all mine. No, you start, you start going after the Lord. You start siding with the Lord. You start <clears throat> gaining ground instead of holding ground or losing ground. just when you begin to see that reality of the New Testament priesthood and you see all that are not joined that are not Levited all that are not really I don't mean theologically really joined are of the rejected tribes all in Adam are rejected, but all in union with Christ are accepted in the beloved. And you are now seen as one with him. But that's, again, and I'm trying to finish that, this little part, that's not meant to be a theological thing that you hold on to. It's meant to be a thing that you see as true and as a Levite, as a priest, you embrace that, and you, from then on, draw your acceptance on the new basis, on the new covenant, on the covenant of priesthood, on the everlasting covenant, and that is 
My acceptance is simply because I'm in union with Christ. And you can shake me, but baby, I ain't going to come, come loose out of this tree. You can shake my tree, but I ain't coming out. And you will be shook. You will, your confidence will be shook. Your, um, all the things that made you comfortable will be shook. Why? Because you only are supposed to be finding your comfort in the Lord. Your portion as a priest is supposed to be the Lord. We say, well, that's supposed to be true. You, Randy, you're a minister. I'm just a... Remember our first class? We're all priests. <laughs> We're all priests. The whole body is called to be a royal priesthood. And so, <clears throat> none of this... See, picture, picture a throne in heaven, you know, God sitting on that throne, and what does he look like? <clears throat> well, he's rather scholarly looking. He's wearing a pinstripe seersucker suit. No, how about just a pinstripe suit with, with a little, uh, yeah, I know. <clears throat> you know, he's got his little uh, thing that he keeps his glasses in. What's the glasses case? Pocket protector, yeah, yeah. He's got that. <clears throat> He's got some little beady glasses, you know, with little tape holding it together in the middle. <clears throat> and he's studying diligently because all is based on scholarship, being scholarly. There is your God. Well, there's some of you. you that is your God. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but... That's not what, he's not up there judging your theology. And they all stood before the Lord and he judged their theology. You never hear that. It's not there. You know? And yet, almost every church, everywhere you go to, everybody's working on that for fear that it'd be wrong. I mean, then what is he judging? He's judging how we live. Do we live by union here or do we live by union here? Do we live by union in Christ, in union with Christ or do we live by union in the old attitudes, motivations, reactions? I'm just telling you, it all gets down to life. I'm come that they might have life. You know, it all comes down to life. We, we, but we say... Here's our definition of life. Yes, it all comes down to life, that we live eternally in heaven forever and ever, and that's what we call life, and that's not life. Jesus is life. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son, <laughs> zilch. You got nothing except for what's in Adam, which you draw from regularly. <laughs> you know? We're supposed to be free of evil thoughts. What, what should control the bride of Christ? Well, see, the groom. But, but she has controls in her mind. She has things that control her. Well, that happened there, so that draws me or, or, or repels me. Well, that, this and that and that, you know, I just, I just, when I just watch Jesus walk, I see that he's not like any other man I ever knew. He's just nothing like anybody I ever knew. He's got peace all the time. You know, even when he's driving the money changers out, he's being zealous for this very thing that we're talking about. He's driving out all the false stuff that has no place in the habitation of God. Only God has a right to dwell in that temple. And we put everything, and we've made it religious, and we made it even look like the Holy Spirit. There's the doves, Jesus, there's the lambs. Is that the Holy Spirit? No. Is that the Lamb of God? No. Here's the Lamb of God. He's got a whip. 
He's got a javelin. He's got a sword. But I thought you loved me. Oh, baby. <laughs> Do I ever. <laughs> right? Oh, man. I love you even unto death. See, I mean, isn't that what a woman wants to hear? Do you love me unto death? Oh, yeah. You just don't know what that means. <laughs> It'll be under your death. <laughs> but he takes us into it, doesn't he? I mean, he, he joins us and takes us into it, but folks, it's not like it doesn't, we don't feel the, the, the reality of it, you know. You know, when our mind wants to go wandering off, and he says, stop it. When our fears want to rise and take control, he says, no. And with her, he's not wanting to just go in there with a whip and drive him out. With her, he's wanting her to drive him out and get with him. Do you understand that? That would be true oneness. That's really what it is. Oh. Then you start really comprehending him. And then you just want to get with him. And, of course, we're not talking about men and women here. Can I get amen? We're talking about Christ and the church. We're not talking about shadows. You can have the best formed shadow in the world, and it still is not substance. You can live after the shadow. You can form it up. Israel had the best shadow. Jesus had to come and do away with it. In reality, fulfill it all, and he was the reality. You see that? Do you, do you see that? He didn't just do away with it. He came and said, okay. There was a shadow based on something. I'm what it was based on. You know, he, he didn't just come. See, that's another part of it. We, we think Jesus came, well, he just mad at everything, wants to tear everything up and start new. He didn't come to tear everything up and start new. He came to fulfill. He came to show that he was the fulfillment of it. No, you weren't wrong, but just the shadow, shadow time is over. Many people, that's what they're fighting. That's what they're wrestling with. They're shadow boxing. Yeah, they're, they're, they're fighting, you know, poking at, you know, stuff that's already gone, already dead, already finished. They're trying to get the victory. Going to get the victory. That's the big hallmark of the church today, folks. We're going to get the victory. What did, now, what did Jesus do? Well, he put us in a position so we could get the victory. No, he won the victory, and more than that, he is the victory. You be joined into him, that's the victory. He always causes us to triumph in union with Christ. That's what the scripture says. See, we always go, oh, Jesus always makes me a winner. Yeah, Jesus always makes you a winner, a winner, winner. Jesus is not trying to, in that sense, he's not trying to help you build confidence in yourself. He wants your confidence to be in him, not in the flesh. Well, what would the flesh be? My old man? No, you. Your confidence is not supposed to be in you. But I'm good. I mean, there are people that are bad. But I'm good. And I'm honest. And I have integrity. Well, see, Jesus found more hope in prostitutes and, and robbers. Because they at least would admit that they are reprobate. But the good people, no, no, no. No, I'm good. They're bad. Well, I'm not good. I don't, I don't even want to be good. But I do want Christ formed in me. And it upsets me when I see things in me that are not Christ. But it doesn't just upset me. It stirs me to want to get the javelin. 
you know. You want to hear the story just the opposite of that one? David and Saul, King Saul. David was the true king, but he didn't take his position. The people had to give it to him. He didn't take it. People had to give it to him. But he was the king, still walking around, but not, not honored as king, but king nonetheless. King nonetheless from, what, 16 years old, anointed by Samuel himself, the prophet. Oh, my. But sitting up there on the throne, sitting up in Jerusalem, this, this little boy, he's out in the fields tending some sheep. But sitting in the big throne room in Jerusalem with everybody bowing and scraping and bringing their tithes and money and everything else, not tithes, but their tribute, is a man named King Saul. And King Saul, you know, when you're in the flesh, you're going to have problems with demons. You know, you've heard my old saying, flies don't land on a hot stove. <laughs> you know, if you're on fire for God, you'll have less problems with demons. <laughs> you know? But Saul, man, he's trying to be king, and he's not the right one, so he's, he is open to depression. Can I get an amen? He's open to depression. Well, you could get depressed about a lot of things. Why won't these people honor me? Because you're not the one supposed to be honored. Come on, somebody in this room has said that in your head. Why won't these people honor me? Because you're not the one supposed to be honored. Remember, you know, all glory to Jesus, you know, all glory then if, if you still want some glory, stop saying all glory to Jesus and just say glory to Jesus. Be truthful about it. Don't say all glory because you still want some. Most glory to Jesus. I only want, and here's us, 20%. See, we can't even settle for what God would, 10%. We've got to have 20%. <laughs> you know. But, I mean, he gets 80%. Most glory to Jesus. Most glory to Jesus. But, boy, our feelings get hurt when we th think we should have been, when we should have gotten some glory. Well, our feelings get hurt because we're Saul sitting on the throne. And so David comes in, and David, man, he's just at peace. He's just with the Lord, you know. We're the one all balled up. <laughs> We're this boiling pot on the inside of, you know, raw flesh, bubbling up, you know, rancid meat and dried up yucky carrots and stuff. You know, oh, we're boiling in there. Look at, look at that over there. Look. David comes walking in. Now, you'd think getting the throne would be enough. I mean, you got the throne, you got everybody's honor, there's nobody higher than you, there's nothing you don't control. You would think. <laughs> you would think that'd be enough. But it's not. It's not. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. I can tell something's wrong with this deal. I don't feel like what I thought I would feel when I got all this. You know, I, I'm not getting the satisfaction I thought it would bring. So David comes walking in. He's a 16-year-old kid. Well, I, I, I hear you're having a problem with depression and demons and stuff like that. Let me help. David's just sitting there, man. He's just loving on the Lord, man, playing and singing. You know, he's been writing all these songs to God, to Jesus out on the, on the hillside. He's doing it not when he was a king, not when it was a responsibility. It was life. It's just who he was and how he was towards the Lord and how the Lord was in his life, and he just loved it, and it just was right. There's no explanation for it. It was just right. So here he goes. You know. So he's going, here, let me try this one out. The Lord is my shepherd. Ah! <laughs> Saul raises up with a javelin. Wait a minute. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. 
flesh, you're not supposed to be grabbing the javelin and going and killing that which is godly. Well, I know he's just 16, but I sense competition. And he doesn't feel good. I, I know I own everything, and everybody honors me, but I don't want any competition. I mean, not even a little shepherd boy. I don't want him to be able to play better than me. Competition. Huh. Yeah. I don't want no competition. I don't like competition. I don't like something that could actually be better than me, be more of the Lord than me, that could be, oh, uh, I don't like this. Uh, and it starts boiling again, and here it comes boiling and bubbling until you look around and you go, here's a javelin. Take it, and little David sitting there playing an instrument. He's as defenseless as he can be. Thank God that a rage gets you so blinded, your your blood veins sticking out, and your veins in your eyes are all you know red and protruding, and your aim's not quite as good <laughs> because you got one thing on your mind. I, I, I hate this. I, I, So David leaves. David leaves. He just drove off the little bit of God that he had in his life, Saul did. The little bit of peace. But I don't want peace that way. I only get peace by stepping on everything, having it all below me. Can't you just accept him? Well, and then you, have, then you have Saul's son, Jonathan, come in and go, oh. he, he hears him talking, he hears him play, and he goes, I love this guy. I love this guy. My God, I've never heard anybody talk about the Lord the way he does. I've never seen anybody like this. He's different. His ways are different. He talks different. He sings different. He, he carries himself different. I love this guy. And Saul's going, I hate him. I hate him with everything that's in me. Jonathan's going, I can't even explain it. I love him more than my own self. Oh, isn't that the key? To love him more than yourself. Do you love him? Yes. Do you love him more than yourself? Because <laughs> if you don't, when David does stuff that seems to cross you, you're not going to go to the cross. You're going to want to take David to the cross. See, you're not going to be Phineas and stand up for God and stand on his side and attack whatever in you is opposite, whatever rises up instantly, you recognize and you say, man, I can't give place to any of this stuff. I cannot do it. I will not do it. I'm the, the cross. I'm dead. Why am I even playing with this? Anybody ever? Why am I even playing with this? I'm dead. See, it's not that the issue may not be valid. Am I right or wrong? The issue is I'm dead, not that, you know, this is legitimate or, or, or this, isn't, this isn't blatant sin. There's a greater, it is blatant sin. You have joined yourself to Baal Peor. You're joined, you're a Levite, you are a priest of another God. That's the sin of it. We don't see it like that. We're just looking for right and wrong, knowledge of good and evil, weighing everything based on the wrong tree. We're just trying to do 51% good. Well, that's most people, you know. They live off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they feel okay with it because 51% of their fruit is good or 64% so that, folks, it's the wrong tree doesn't matter how much good 
And you know what? It doesn't matter how much bad. It's not about being bad or good. It's about being joined to the one who, who is acceptable. It's about, what is the first commandment? Folks, what do you think motivated Phineas? What do you think motivated Levi? The first commandment, love the Lord thy God. Love. The first commandment is to love God. The first thing God would want, the first thing, if I could, you know, knowing that, you know, you can't command love, you know, you either do or you don't. You know, it's not a head thing. Okay, let's see, he said I got to love God, so I'm going to do it, let's see. Love God, okay, I got it. I love you, God. It doesn't, it's not a head thing. A heart thing. You got to get away from your head, and you got to get away from your uh, actions of uh, trying to please Him, and you got to get into loving the Lord. And if you do, if you if if your love increases and increases, then you'll stand up for the Lord. You won't have to worry about that day. You won't have to fear that day. Your love will put you on his side every time. <laughs> it will. It'll just separate you to him. And then, you know, I was, re- I was reading, what is that scripture? Um, oh, it was in Matthew, I think. And it says, uh, I was reading it today. It says, Beware when all men speak well of you, for so spoke they of the prophets that were, the false prophets that were before you. And I thought, that is the number one goal of every minister in this world is to have everyone speak well of it. I mean, you know, and if somebody doesn't, boy, there's this thing called damage control. Damage control. Well, you know, when you love the Lord, if if you love the Lord and you're joined to the Lord and you're with the Lord, it really doesn't matter who's against you, and God will test that. But it, but it doesn't matter because you're with the Lord. You love the Lord. Your, your heart is with him. And I, Now consider this. Consider that if ever you lost everything and all this, you know, da-da-da-da, and you're really, really with the Lord, gee, man, you're a winner. And you're a real winner because you still, you know, you've got, you know, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. So in the beginning you have eternal oneness, withness. Then all things came out from that. In the beginning was Word, Word was with God, Word was God. By Him were all things created. I forget the, the exact wording, but basically from that point he starts talking about it creating eternal oneness brought forth the created things. And if you're with the Lord, even if you have nothing, that eternal oneness, was just it just starts creating. Stuff starts happening. Reality. Newness. Light. Life. It all springs from that. If you don't have that, it don't matter, you know, you, you got every reason to fear. You have every reason to fear and tremble and go, oh my God, Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so anyway, the first point is you got to be, you got to be separated from the rejected tribe. And you got to be joined to the only acceptable life, which is Christ. That's what makes you a priest. And that joining, that joining will cause you to to priest. I'm saying that word now, not as a noun, but as a verb. That joining will cause you to priest. You'll just priest. You won't try to do priest things. You'll just priest. And you'll know, 
because you've got the compass. You've got the compass. It's like it's on the inside of your heart. Crisis, tribulation hits it. Man, it spins. It always does. Bam. Ends up pointing right back at Jesus. Every time. Every time. Every time. It's just the compass of your heart now. Where, you know, that's, Jesus had confidence in Peter in this sense when he said, will you go away also? And Peter said, where am I going to go? My compass just points at you. <laughs> you know? I mean, it just, it just, I mean, I've been hit and bumped and Jesus is thinking, well, you're going to get some more. But even through the worst of it, he stayed, it, ends, it always spins around, yeah, and you, where it stops, nobody knows. But after about, you know, your first 5,000 hits, you start going, you know what, my heart is for the Lord. I know where it's going to end up. It'll end up going right back to Jesus. So what am I worrying about? Why do I have to worry through all of this? Why can't I just be confident with the Lord? Amen? All right, well, maybe we ought to stop. Let's stop and take a break, and we'll come back in a few minutes.